which is Jeannie Chari. And Jeannie is a professor at College of the Canyons in the biological and environmental sciences uh, department. She's the lead faculty for several biology courses and the environmental science program uh, here at the college. She also advises the Hands-On Earth Club. As coordinator of the Campus Biodiversity Initiative, she mentors students on their campus as a living lab project. So welcome, Jeannie. Uh, please feel free to start. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, is that good? Looks good. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I actually have the exciting opportunity to have four of my biodiversity initiative students with me this morning. So we are all are going to give a very brief presentation, probably talking a little bit fast. So let me start with just talking about our environmental programs that we have. We have three courses. Uh, we have Introduction to Environmental Science. We have Introduction to Environmental Studies. And we have energy resource conservation, which looks at um, energy use and production. We have an AST in environmental science. So if you take all of these courses, then once you complete them, you are guaranteed acceptance into a Cal State. And we also have an AA in environmental studies. So if you have any questions about any of these, please reach out to me. I really like talking to students about these things. Um, just a quick note about my pathway to get where I am here. It was extremely convoluted and there were many kind of paths that I took. So my advice to all students is don't worry if your path is a little bit convoluted. Um, just be sure to be learning along the way because everything I've done has helped me get where I am here now and I really enjoy my job. So just have confidence. And my advice is just don't stop moving keep putting one foot in front of the other. So I'm gonna talk about the biodiversity initiative that we have really quickly. And the impetus for it is that we have 1 million plant and animal species that are threatened with extinction right now, many within decades. Uh, we have found that 77% of the land on our planet has been impacted by human activities. And that's the primary driver of this biodiversity loss. We have lost 25% of our bees in the last 30 years and 50% of our plant biomass. And the World Economic Forum just recently voiced strong concerns about this in terms of the potential to lose half of our global GDP and to increase our risk for future socioeconomic shocks, pandemics. So we think it's very important to have this biodiversity initiative to work locally on global problems. So we began this initiative in 2016, um, having students work on projects and research using our campus ground. This gives them kind of like an internship experience so that when we transfer to a four year, they are prepared to compete for those internship opportunities because they've worked really hard in a similar fashion we have students monitoring our bird, butterfly, and bee populations on campus. They are involved in habitat enrichment, building homes, providing water, and introducing a lot of native veg vegetation onto campus. In regard to jobs, I have um, information if anybody's interested of a whole list of jobs that my students have now that have already graduated and ones that come my way. But I just wanted to show you four that just came across my desk that have to do with the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's reasonable pay available if you get degrees in this field. Um, so lots of neat opportunities. These are just some of the projects our students have done. So here's one of the bird baths they created. We have several on our campuses. We extensively used our makerspace to build 30 different bird homes for six different species. We have incredible support from facilities. Um, they help our students with all of their projects on things they couldn't necessarily do, but need to do, like get a whole load of mulch somewhere or 
put an owl box 20 feet up in a pine tree. So we have a lot of support in that direction. We monitor all of our bird boxes and have collected our data and are analyzing it. We have had students develop a book, it's an online book of all of our campus birds with student illustrations, student poetry, and student narratives about these birds. We are monitoring our cliff swallow population on campus. Uh, we suspect there may be some competition with the non-native European house sparrows. So we've had students um, note every single cliff swallow nest on every single floor of every single building. And we look forward to seeing what's going on with this competition in the spring. We have 13 locations across both of our campuses that are dedicated to native plants and student research. So the students really are using the campus grounds um, to do these projects. So these are just a couple of the past ones. Um, students spend a lot of time doing habitat restoration. This is an area between the five and our campus where uh, we're trying to bring back a lot of um, native uh, ecosystem habitat. Uh, we had a student study, what's the best food to feed native birds that the competing European house sparrows won't like? And she shared that information with her homeowners association. So it was actually very useful. Uh, we had a student who came up with a great idea of how to get rid of invasive non-natives and that is to collect them and eat them. Uh, so she made dolmas, uh, she made uh, mustard burritos, and she made fennel pesto. Um, and then, of course, she also made buckwheat bread, just for the heck of it, even though that's a name. And the way students participate in these programs is they enroll in the QUI 186 environment course. It's a half a unit course, cooperative work experience. And now I'm excited to introduce four of our students who are enrolled in that course this semester who will share with you their project. So the first one is Kyla Massey. So welcome, Kyla. Let me stop sharing so you can share. Thank you so much for the introduction. Okay, so let me share with you my presentation on the research that I'm currently doing. Hi, my name is Kyla Massey, and I'm currently doing research on California native plants with medicinal properties. So the reason why I chose this topic is because I am currently a pre-med student at College of the Canyons, and I wanted to figure out a way to combine my love for plants and medicine. So this is why I decided to do research on native plants that have been traditionally used by indigenous people in a medicinal way. My goal with this research is to compile research on these medicinal plants and successfully grow them in the gardens and on campus at COC. So I'm gonna talk about a few of the plants that I am currently doing research on and along with like some of the medicinal properties that they have and which part of the plant that is used medicinally. So the first one is California Evening Primrose. It is a native perennial flowering plant. The leaves of the plant are what were traditionally used and it has properties such as wound healing, hormone balancing, it helps with menopause and uterine issues. And as you can see in the images here, they are very beautiful flowering plants and the leaves over here are what were used to make like a tea. And the next one that I'm talking about is mugwort. It is an aromatic flowering plant. Both the leaves and the roots were used medicinally. It's beneficial for the skin, it aids in digestion, promotes circul circulation, it helps combat addiction mechanisms, and it was also used as a sedative. So in order to distinguish native mugwort from other mugwort, I did include a photo of the, the mugwort that I am researching. Um, so as you can see, the leaves have a very distinct shape. The next one is yarrow. It is a native flowering plant. The leaf, stem, and the flowers were used medicinally. It helps cure a fever or the common cold. Um, the leaves were typically chewed on to cure toothaches, and it also helps stop bleeding and provides minor pain relief. Uh, Cleveland sage is another one. It is a native aromatic sage plant. The leaves were used medicinally, and it is used to treat um, like the cough and chest cold, it helps with poison oak rashes, and it is also used for pain relief. 
another one is elderberry. This is a native flowering plant and the flowers and leaves were used medicinally. I know that there's also people that consume the berries and um, overall the plant helps with pain relief, swelling, inflammation, it induces sweating, it cures colds and flus, and it helps boost the immune system. Herba Buena is another plant that I'm studying. It is a native aromatic herb, and it helps with pain relief, stomach aches, tooth aches, headaches. It naturally winds teeth. A lot of tooth toothpaste brands like to include it into their toothpaste, and it also helps support the cardiovascular system. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Okay, so now we have uh, Genesis Valle. Genesis, share your screen. Hello everybody, my name is Genesis Valle and my research is going to be on population and diversity in Southern California Lepidoptera and uh, native flora. Um, I'm a student here at College of the Canyons and I'm also part of the Biodiversity Initiative and I just wanted to start off with a little bit of information of why butterflies are important. Um, they are major indicators of climate change. Um, their wings are extremely sensitive to climate change and therefore they can sense certain changes in the weather. And they can also, um, when it comes to the morpho butterflies, some of the wing color will even change depending on like what kind of um, vapors are in the air. Um, they are also major pollinators and their wings are actually at the forefront of medical and scientific advancements with different um, medical instruments, and even some medicinally. So my primary goal of this research is to monitor and record eight different species of butterflies before and after specialized flora has been planted in and around campus at uh, various different locations on campus. And I've chosen 10 specialized plants, five are host plants, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> and this is uh, all the butterflies I've chosen. Um, so we have the monarch, common buckeye, marine blue, any swallowtail, western tiger swallowtail, the California dogface, which is actually our native butterfly um, to California. And then I have the morning cloak and the American lady. And um, these are all the plants that I've chosen. So I've chosen five host plants and five feeding plants. Um, the difference between the two is important because butterflies are very picky where they lay their eggs and they will only lay their eggs on these specific host plants. Therefore, I chose host plants that multiple of these butterflies could lay their eggs on and also feed on. Uh, thankfully, butterflies are not too picky and they will feed on any plant as long as it's colorful and pretty. Um, and I've also sp chosen each one specifically uh, to make sure that they're all California native plants and they're mostly drought resistant that way we can save water and you know help with the drought. And these are some of the pictures of the native plants that I've chosen. A lot of them do coincide with my other two peers and their plants. And hopefully my goal with this research is to increase the population of butterflies and other organisms that will benefit from all these plants. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Genesis. And now we have Iwakichi and Guido. You please to share your screen. All right. Uh, can you see it? Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Iwakichi and Guido, and I am a first year college student part of the Biodiversity Initiative here at College of the Canyons. And today I will be presenting my project to you all, which is planting Southern California wildflowers to help native bees. Oops. Okay, <laughs> so sorry. Uh, so starting off about my project, it will be taking place on campus and I will be planting wildflowers on four different plots. However, I will focus on the plot by Aliso Hall today, which is pictured right here. It is this slope by the stairs. 
Um, and anyways, my goal is to benefit the native bee population by giving them these wildflowers so they have more resources to survive. So for further details, I will be attracting a lot of different species of bees. However, today I will share two that my project will be focusing on. These include the yellow-faced bumblebee and the sweat bee, both of which are native to California. So the native, the yellow-faced bumblebee is pictured at the top left right here, and the sweat bee is at the bottom left right here. So both of these bees are generalist feeders, which means they are not very picky in what flower they get nectar and pollen from. Um, however, like humans, they both have their favorite foods. So the yellow-faced bumblebee and sweat bee both favor the Escolgia californica, or more commonly known as the California poppy, which is also the state flower, and is pictured here at the top right. Additionally, the lupinus ninus, or the sky lupine, which is pictured here at the bottom right, also attracts bumblebees and other native bees as well. In fact, the lupine species is quite liked in the bee community. So I will be planting lots of different species of wildflowers that will attract multiple different species of bees, and I look forward to seeing them flourish in the spring. All right, so before I finish, um, I just wanted to show you a closer picture of the quote by Lisa Hall. And if you look closely at this post right here, you can actually see that this is a solitary bee house. And right here is just a very short life cycle of a solitary bee. So inside one of these little holes is an egg, which then hatches into a larva, which then becomes a pupa. And once it eventually matures into an adult, it'll start uh, pollinating uh, flowers. And after that, it will begin to build its own nest and lay its egg, and hence restarting the cycle. So perhaps you have seen these uh, houses before and maybe around you or on campus. And so now I know just a little bit more about them. But anyways, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit and thanks so much, have a great day. Thank you, Iwikichi. We have one more, Auntie Ta. She's going to be quick because we know we're running behind. Thank you, Auntie, welcome. Hello, let me share my screen real quick. Hello everyone, my name is Auntie Ta. I'm a freshman at COC and my project is actually an experiment I'll be running at home based on our buscular mycorrhizae. Our buscular mycorrhizae are fungi that form a symbiotic relationship with plant roots, meaning that the fungus will attach to the roots and their tendrils will spread out through the dirt as pictured by these purple tendrils right here. Uh, the branch-like parts of the mycorrhizae, called hyphae, penetrate the cell wall of the roots directly, which allows them to take water and minerals that they find in the soil and transport them directly to the host plant. And in return, the plant will give them carbohydrates and amino acids, so both parties are happy. You can introduce mycorrhizae into the soil using inoculants, pictured right here. Inoculants are mixtures of filler ingredients like clay and fungal spores. So you can think of them as like seeds, but for fungi. You can also buy inoculants anywhere like on Amazon and put them in your own garden. Um, now some plants are picky and they prefer specific species of mycorrhizae. So I want to know which species will promote the most growth in white sage and desert globe mallow. Both of these plants are native to California, so I want to help them grow faster and resist the temperature extremes of Santa Clarita. Now, this, this experiment will be using two brands of inoculant, Dynamico and Mycobliss. Each brand contains different species of mycorrhizae. So uh, if a plant grows better when mixed with Dynamico, I'll know that the species in this brand are the best for that plant. For each species of plant, I will have three types of pots. Uh, the first pot will be mixed with Dynamico inoculant or DM. The second will be mixed with Myco Bliss. And the third pot will have no inoculant at all to serve as a control. I will have four replicates of each plant. So that's 24 pots in total. I will grow each for two months. And at the end, I'll compare the inoculated pots to the control pots. 
If the inoculated pots grow taller or grow more leaves than the control pots, I can assume that the mycorrhizae actually helped them. And I'll also plant these plants on campus at COC when I'm done. With this knowledge, I hope to support our native plants as well as Iwakichi's bee plants, Genesis's butterfly plants, and Kyla's medicinal plants as best as I can. Thank you so much for listening.